Good morning to you, Randy. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Joyce. Thanks so much for tuning in to the program this morning. And want to start, uh, first of all, by giving you and the rest of the staff at the Commons uh, kudos on getting primary election news into this week's edition of the Commons. Uh, I know that they didn't call the race for lieutenant governor until about 11 o'clock at night. So to get in the news about who won the nominations for Republican and Democrat for governor, Phil Scott and Sue Minter, and then the different ballot questions in the different communities, Dummerston, Newfane, Vernon, Halifax, a late night for you all at the paper. Unfortunately, it was also a a very technically glitchy night, too. We were having real serious computer problems, and that delayed the paper getting out. The election results were the least of it. We (laughs) had pretty much everything, everything we needed to know by midnight, which for by election night standards is early. But uh, we had problems putting the paper together. We had problems getting into the press. We had problems delivering the paper. We got calls yesterday from people who were looking at their normal haunts, like up at Price Chopper or BMH, and yesterday afternoon couldn't find the paper. I've been assured by our circulation guy, Barry Oleshnik, everybody got papers delivered to their spots. The mail was held up a day, so you should be getting your commons in today's mail if you live in Brattleboro. And uh, we're sorry. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, the, again, the, the bad timing uh, for those technical issues. I guess this is a good time to, to put in a pitch. Uh, if people want to support the Commons, you can go to commonsnews.org, become a member, maybe help you uh, uh, in, invest in some things that would overcome some of these technical glitches, right? Well, yes, but some <laughs> of it was also related to uh, some of our cloud cloud computing that we use to, to manage the very hundreds of thousands of files we have backed up. But yes, this was an interesting, interesting election. Um, I think Sue Minter definitely pulled away from the from the field in the last few weeks, and and uh, had the edge on uh, on Galbraith and uh, and Dunn for, for on the Democratic side. And uh, I think Bruce Lisman right now holds the dubious record of spending the most money per vote of any candidate in the history of Vermont. Yeah, he he does. Uh, And and during a primary, no less, he outspent, uh, I think, anybody who's spent in both the primary and general election. Uh, To his credit, uh, we'll we'll give Bruce a little credit here, because I don't think anybody thought that he would get 40 percent of the vote in the primary. To me, even though, yeah, he even though Phil Scott beat him by 20 points, uh, that's probably a little bit closer than a lot of people thought it would be. Yeah, a little closer than than people might have thought, but I think that might be just residual distrust of, of Phil Scott because he worked with a Democrat. Yes. So that's it. I mean, Republicans aren't supposed to do that, right? No, no, they're not. In fact, I just spent 20 minutes on the phone with Bruce Parker of Vermont Watchdog talking about how Phil Scott tries to extricate himself from being part of the Shumlin administration for the last six years. Uh, Which because, is kind of hard when you're the lieutenant governor of the Shumlin administration. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, and obviously he's he's got to do it. He's got to try and draw a distinction uh, between himself and, and Sue Minter. But both of them are insiders, so to speak, in in governance in the last six years. Uh, that is not going to be an easy task for him. Uh, how do you think he's going to do it? Well, I think it's going to be the normal electoral math in in Vermont that we've seen for the last. 20 years or so, we we know we can recite this by heart. There's 40% of the vote people who will vote for Republicans no matter what. There are 40% of the vo- voters who will vote for Democrats no matter what. And then there's that 20% in the, in the middle of independents, or they used to be called Douglas Democrats back when Jim was the governor, but uh, they're, they're the ones that are kind of free-floating and up for grabs either way. And I think this this election is going to be kind of one of those wave elections because of all the the enthusiasm Bernie stirred up with his presidential run. Yeah. So I think there's going to be a, a big turnout this year. It's going to be heavily Democratic, uh, motivated by the desire to also send Donald Trump to oblivion, where he richly deserves to be. And um, I think anybody with a D next to their name is going to benefit from that. Right. Well, and, and especially uh, the D's in Vermont with the lieutenant governor, being a progressive who was endorsed by Bernie Sanders, you got to think that that's going to count for something when people go to the polls in November. It probably is good for the Democrats that David Zuckerman is their candidate for lieutenant governor. Well, I think the Bernie endorsement is probably what, what lifted him from the pack. Yeah. Because uh, at the end, it would look like Chap was going to be the winner. I mean, that he, he entered the lieutenant governor's race and kind of sucked all the air out. 
and everyone thought, oh, well, Shep's got this one. But yeah. uh, I think the Bernie seal of approval really made a difference with the, with the Bernie voters, and uh, they showed up in force and, and to push Zuckerman over the top. I really, even watching the results through the night, I really didn't think he could hang on because I thought, Shep, yeah, he's going to win. Right. Yeah, you saw the 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 precincts reporting the different uh, districts, and you didn't see Burlington, right? But then again, uh, even though Shap Smith is a Washington County representative, he's an attorney in Burlington. Uh, that's David Zuckerman's home ground, and uh, so it clearly carried him. Uh, be very fascinating to see. I mean, that would be the highest any progressive has ascended in state politics here, uh, what that would mean for how the Senate is conducted and, and how policy is conducted if we have a Minter Zuckerman top of the ticket with a Democratic-controlled legislature. I think Zuckerman's leadership skills will not be, you know, it, it won't be a, a big change from, from the way things have been. I think it's be, uh, David has the benefit of having a term in the Senate, so at least he knows a little bit more about the workings of it, if, as opposed to when he was still serving in the House. And so there's a familiarity factor, at least with the uh, other members of the Senate. So it should the learning curve shouldn't be so tough for him. No, and what, well, what about running against Randy Brock, uh, somebody who is also well-known here in the state? Uh, do you think he's got a serious challenge? No. You don't, really? Randy, Randy Brock, uh, at least from, you know, we we saw how, how badly, well, actually it was a narrow victory by... Uh, by uh, Tom Salmon for auditor when he lost that race by uh, by recount and uh, on the do over he also lost. I think uh, you know it's his time has come gone and will stay that way. I don't I don't see I don't see him with a, a serious chance. Right, and then of course there's the odd couple possibility of Phil Scott as governor, David Zuckerman as lieutenant governor. <laughs> well, there there yeah. may be some cantankerous folk who think you know divided government. That's what keeps people honest. Right. So, yeah, there could be the 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 the, uh, the odd couple coupling, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's likely either. If they're going to go for if the Phil if the Phil Scott supporters are going to vote for Phil Scott, they're going to definitely vote for Randy Brock. Yeah, well, that decision was made on Tuesday. Other decisions made in the different communities who had ballot questions on their ballots when they went to the polls. Uh, In Dummerston, Newfane, Halifax, and Vernon, we'll take up those questions with Randy Ola, Deputy Editor of the Commons, as well as other stories found in this week's edition of Commons. And if you haven't gotten the paper yet, it's coming. He promises. (laughs) We'll be back with more Green Mountain Mornings after these messages. Some New Orleans piano rolls for the New Orleans-like humidity that's outside at 21 minutes before the 9 o'clock hour here in southern Vermont. The deep south of Vermont, right, Randy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is feeling very Louisiana-ish, Georgia-ish. It is, it is thick out there. It, it's only 75 degrees, though. You have this humidity, and it would be 90 by now uh, in, the, in the south, and that's really what makes uh, the oppressiveness even more oppressive. Not that uh, we need to compete on that level. Looking forward to a breaking... Happy to see the weather nut in the commons uh, saying that some relief is on the way at the end of the weekend. Yeah, so you got looks looking like a lot of rain coming our way, which is definitely needed because we're still in drought drought uh, stage, at least the uh, second stage. Some of uh, eastern Massachusetts, from what I've been seeing in the in the papers, is in severe drought stage, which is unusual for Mass for for the Northeast. Yeah, and so people uh, now there is weather in the commons, uh, both uh, online and in the. Uh, edition that comes out every Wednesdays on stands. Uh, so another reason to pick up the edition of the Commons and another reason to support this award-winning independent news and views source for Wyndham County. We talk with Randy Holha, its deputy editor, every Friday about some of the stories. Now, we talked about the statewide election results uh, with Sue Minter, Phil Scott, and David Zuckerman all winning the nominations in their primary races. But some of the communities down here in Wyndham County had some ballot questions. And uh, your hometown of Dummerston, saying yes to a fire station. You've probably visited a fire station. Sounds like a good thing, a necessary thing. Yeah, that thing is clearly not <laughs> suited for, for modern fire apparatus or, or uh, just modern firefighting. But it's really a good thing and, and to have 
of, of a fire station in the center of Dummerson and it cuts down on, on response time. And uh, we've partaken of that ourselves here on, on, at, the, at the compound. Twenty years ago, we had a, a chimney fire here, and uh, Joyce was alone at the time, and she called called in the fire. And they were there were people here within five or five minutes, and they saved the house from burning down. Was it a uh, was it a foregone conclusion? Were, were the Dummerston residents uh, pretty much in in favor of this? We've obviously seen resistance to spending money on emergency <laughs> facilities in other communities that I won't bring up right now, and then certainly other communities have been resistant to spending money. But the fact that uh, the people of Dummerston had already done quite a bit of fundraising for this, uh, how much do you think that made a difference in the vote? Well, for the firefighters themselves, they were rather torqued that they had to, to, to kind of uh, force this vote by uh, gathering t- petitions for a, a, a referendum. Okay. This should have, you know, this should have been a, a, a no-brainer as far as they're concerned, because because of the need, and because they've been doing independent fundraising on their to help defer the cost. Uh, if the fundraising continues, the commitment by the town will be minimal. But this is this is a really important thing for for everybody that to have adequate fire protection. And unlike a certain town that begins with B, uh, <laughs> most of the people agreed. We kind of wondered about the 65 people who voted against it and what, what their problem was, but it overwhelmingly passed as, as well as should have because like all, like many volunteer fire departments in Vermont, the Dummerston the fire department does a really good job and deserves our support. Yeah, and deserves to have the resources to fight the fires uh, that they need. Now, it, it sounds to me, and I haven't really been following closely, the select board needed more convincing than the, the voting public in Dummerston. Yeah, yeah they did. Yeah. And uh, and uh, as I said, the, the fire department was kind of torqued about that. Yeah. I heard from one one of the firefighters yesterday that said uh, if that if people in Dummerson voted that down, there wouldn't have been a fire department the next day. Mm, they yeah. would have just quit. They would have just quit. Well, and now contrast that with the vote in Newfane, where uh, the officials in Newfane have been saying we could use new town offices. Uh, these are antiquated. They're they're not adequate for what we do. And still, the voters in Newfane said, "Nope, we're not going to pay for that." And you know, patch, patch, patch. Uh, dealing with just a, a, a substandard public building, and I don't understand that vote either because you know it's your town hall. Hey, you don't would... you have any have pride in your community keep, to keep up your building and have it not just presentable to the community but also functional, so you can the, your, your, the functions of your town can be carried out in a safe atmosphere. Well, doesn't doesn't this speak to some of the? I don't know if antiquated is the right word, but right, we saw the Newfane voters reject the idea of professionalizing some of the posts in government uh, either a year ago or or maybe it was two town meetings ago, uh, and they also um, are have a hard time filling posts on their school board. Uh, there, there's just a kind of I don't know if it's if it's a uh, boredom or or just disinterest in in town government but to me that's what it that's what it said is you know we don't care enough about local governance here to really make this kind of investment well i think you can extrapolate that out that you know that our nation in general yeah seems to have lost interest in the idea of self-government yeah. and uh, and because it's hard work it's messy it's time consuming you don't always get the result you think you're going to get but it's necessary because we know what the alternative is. Yeah. Well, and, and Newfane, they, well, they still are the county seat, right? I mean, it's, it's just amazing to think that they're in, in Newfane, uh, where it is the county seat, used to be a more prominent part before Brattleboro really became the hub of Wyndham County. Uh, and, and this is the way that its uh, constituency uh, responds when it comes time to actually invest in governance. Uh, it was really some surprising to me, although I guess it shouldn't have been. Uh, that the vote went against bonding for new town offices. So they're going to be stuck in that old building, uh, and we'll see what happens there. Let's turn to Vernon. Uh, the vote, no surprise that they withdrew from the Brattleboro Union High School District. Uh, that was pretty much a foregone conclusion, the way we saw them also withdraw from the Act 46 Study Committee. When I posted that news on my Facebook page, Randy, a lot of expatriates from this area, particularly from, you know, my generation of Vernon Elementary School graduates were like, what does this mean? Where, where are those kids going to go to school? 
and they're going to go to school where they go to school now. The difference is, you know, if, they're go- if they choose to go to uh, BOHS like many dumb, uh, Vernon kids do, they're going to have to be tuitioned. Right. Or they're going to go to Pioneer Valley. Yeah. <laughs> or be, or Northfield Mount Hermon or any of the other alternatives right. that uh, are open to that. I mean, it was clear from the vote that for Vernon, school choice trumps everything, and the 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 system that Vernon Vernon has, where a, a Vernon family can send their their child to whatever high school they they want within reason and will get paid for up to the the grant level of uh, of you know the standard student fee for you know, what it costs to educate a kid in Vermont. That's a, no, very few towns in Vermont have that arrangement. Yeah. I'm going to have Mike Hebert on the program on Monday. Uh, I think he's taking a, a gamble here. I don't know how big of a gamble it is, but I think he's gambling that Act 46, something major is going to happen with that law, maybe not repealed, but there's going to be a major overhaul of it in the new legislative session. I think that's that is something that's very likely to happen, given the the level of opposition to it. Uh, it's a bill that very few people are are have any support for. Nevertheless, if he if he loses that gamble, uh, you know, obviously he's chair of the school board, he's state representative. It, it could have uh, implication for those posts that he hold, but even even greater implication if the town of Vernon, which has been decrying affordability. Uh, has to pay tuition to go to these schools. Uh, it could it could really backfire if nothing does happen. Especially since the Vernon tax bills have gone up, although it's they're still lower than the rest of the county. Yeah, yeah. How about in Halifax? This was actually something that that I haven't been following. You guys have had some stories about Halifax and and zoning. <laughs> I, I I really until I saw a couple of stories recently, I didn't realize that it had become a ballot measure to completely do away with zoning in a town like Halifax. That, that to me, it seemed to be a bit extreme. Uh, you know, cooler heads prevailed there by saying no to this repealing of zoning laws, in my opinion. But not by much. I mean, no. it's very, it very, was very much a split decision in that case, and it just went, you know, nearly a tie, but uh, they voted to keep zoning. Uh, you know, once you have it, it's hard to justify doing without it. And you need to have some something in place that guides guides development so you can c- control what you can have in your town and what you don't want in your town. And uh, in the case of the, the, the quarry that they wanted to build in Halifax, there were, uh, you know, there was a, a pretty strong split there, too, between people who thought, yeah, good, another business uh, business in town, and, uh, you know, why should we prevent this guy from uh, doing business in our town to uh, why do we need all this trucks, noise, dirt, uh, and destruction? Yeah, I mean, as much as I think uh, Bellows Falls made a mistake with the zoning ordinance they passed around detention facilities in the downtown area, that to me, again, they they specified a type of business that they did not feel desirable. It would have been, probably would have gotten more support in Halifax had they just basically specified a business like a quarry or, or some broader category of that type. Well, they went tried to go all the way with that, and I think... Uh... Kara uh, column from from in uh, last week's paper, which outlined all the arguments about what was going on in Halifax and uh, the the deep c- split in the community over this. That you know there are people that really like Dumber. And I keep saying Dumber. <laughs> Halifax. <laughs> Halifax, right? Halifax to be to be you know you know why they moved to, moved to Halifax, right? Uh, to to you know a nice quiet. Uh, country town yeah we're covering a lot of towns here uh, in this conversation with randy olhead of the commons and we're going to move to Wyndham and grafton now because uh, mike fair's story uh it really i i w- want to say it's about time we got meadows end's point of view in this controversial Stylesbrook wind project it was really to me uh reminded me of of the tension between a couple different generations of vermonters uh of Vermont, where you have people who are stewards of the land, even though they use it for hunting and fishing or use it for foresting, and understand that that is part of being uh, a good environmental steward of the land, uh, and saying that, yeah, you can do what you want on your private land. And then this newer generation of Vermont that says, well, it's part of a community. We all have a say in what goes on there. It's a fascinating tension between a couple of generations of Vermont to me that even goes beyond the whole idea 
of whether wind is a good idea or a bad idea in the renewable energy portfolio. So I, I was really happy to see you guys uh, put such focus on that in this article. Yes, yeah, because you can see that how how many different uses are going on in that land. That it's yeah, you know, part of the 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 snowmobile trail network in the state and it's heavily used that way. As you saw from one of the pictures, the the Southern Loop, the main uh, line for uh, electricity between Brattleboro and, and Bennington, you know, very key part of the electric, electric distribution system goes right through that that property. Yeah. So it's you know not exactly this pristine. Uh, place that the the proponent the opponents of wind power say because there's a big gash in the through in the in the forest where the two two big power lines are going through. And many of these wind opponents might be the very same people who are using the trail access that they allow. I, you know, it would be an interesting outcome from this if Meadows End closes out that opportunity for people to enjoy these so-called pristine trails. You, when you're a, when you're a forester, you're definitely thinking long term. You're not thinking about uh, next year or the next decade, you're thinking 50, 50 years from now. Yeah, that, that... And you're planning accordingly like that. And uh, there's a good chance, you know, if the worst scenarios come true, you're not going to beat the maples on that uh, on that uh, in that forest anymore. Yeah, that that forester's name is Jeremy Turner, and he's definitely a good resource there that Mike speaks to for that article. Bringing this back full circle to the. Uh, to the uh, gubernatorial election, Randy, you think about some of the comments Phil Scott has made. He, he doesn't agree that wind is part of the renewable energy port so, portfolio, but he's also essentially a climate change denier. Now, you even ask Annette Smith, she believes climate change is human caused. It'll be interesting to see how many of those voters go for Phil Scott. There is about <laughs> as, as much consensus as you can possibly have among scientists that the, the Earth's climate's changing. Mm -hmm. The change is man-made. It's close to being irreversible unless we do something drastic very soon. And anyone who believes otherwise is a fool <laughs> and an idiot yeah. and doesn't deserve to hold public office. We will see how many Vermonters, especially the anti-wind people, agree with you because you have Sue Minter, who is certainly believes the signs of climate change, but also believes that wind turbines are part of Vermont's renewable energy future. I think it's going to be a very interesting choice. I'd love to hear who Annette Smith and, and other anti-wind people end up endorsing. Well, uh, they were endorsing race. Peter Galbraith. Right, right. But now... <laughs> in, in, the, in the primary. <laughs> right. Now we'll see. And, and you saw that Galbraith couldn't endorse Minter. Uh, because of that, he, he refused to do so. Let's turn to uh, a more pleasant topic, sports, although not so pleasant when you talk about some of the great runs that the Brattleboro baseball teams have had coming to an end when they reach the regionals, both the American Legion post-5 team and the Little Leaguers uh, losing in the regionals. and uh, But still a good run nonetheless to be champions of Vermont. Yeah, and having the, 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 uh, the trifecta of championships for uh, at the Little League, Babe Ruth, and Legion level which, uh, to my knowledge, hasn't been done in a very long time in Brattleboro, if ever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a good sign that there's the, the baseball culture in Brattleboro is, is coming back, and it's strong, and uh, we can look forward to even more success in future years. Yeah, and maybe in football, too, the first Shrine Game victory over New Hampshire in 15 years. That was the lead story in your sports column. That's good Although stuff. it may come with an asterisk since no. a lot of the good players bailed on nope. the game to play in the uh, – the Granite State's version of the trying game, you know, oh. the, the East-West All-Star game. They're afraid of us. That's that's I my guess explanation. So. They're afraid for of it. going to Castleton. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't want to lose to Vermont. Uh, Fifty to two was the score. So may, maybe if those New Hampshire players were playing, it would have been fifty to seventeen. I'll, I'll give you that. Well, I'm thinking our, <laughs> our representatives did a fine job there too. Both uh, Zach Streeter and and, uh, and Taylor King had interceptions, and Alex Harrison led with 10 tackles. Yeah. Uh, so the defense definitely set the tone for the game, and they were aggressive on offense, and it was a nice to see, finally, a, a Vermont win. Yeah, indeed. First time in 15 years. You can read about it in the pages of this week's edition of The Commons. Your reader-supported independent news and views source for Wyndham County. Free on stands every Wednesday online at commonsnews.org. Randy, always good to talk to you. Sends me off into the weekend in a good mood. We'll talk to you next week. All right. See you then. All right.
commonsnews.org is the web address. That does it for this edition of Green Mountain Mornings. Had a nice long conversation with Randy there. We will be back Monday morning, 6 a.m. Thanks to all the people who joined me on today's program. Randy Holhut of the Commons, Bruce Parker of Vermont Watchdog, and Dan Lefkowitz taking us on a journey down the rabbit hole. Thanks also to Brattleboro Community Television for coming in here and filming these conversations we have with local media. You'll be able to see that on BCTV's channels 8 and 10, as well as online at BrattleboroTV.org. Stephanie Miller Show coming up next on WKVT 100.3 FM and AM 1490. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow, or not tomorrow morning, Monday morning, 6 a.m.